my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code birthhour15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Megan all about her experience using Aeroflow Breast Pumps to get her breast pump for free through insurance. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options, and this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth, because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to the birthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called beyond the first latch. That is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work. If that's part of your plan And we have a special coupon code for you. It's 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's thebirthhour.com slash course. And last thing before we get to the episode, we also want to share that we have a Patreon page. This has been going for about seven years now, and it's a place where you can support the birth hour, but you get fun perks in return, like access to over 600 additional birth stories that are not in your main podcast feed. And of course, membership in our private Facebook group at the $5 a month or more level. This is the best place on the internet. You hear people talk about it a lot on the podcast. It's a great place to get support, find friendship, get questions answered, and connect over our love of birth stories. So check that out at patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's birth story guest is Magdalena, and she has two stories to share. The first is a hospital birth with an epidural, and she felt like she really just didn't do a whole lot to prepare for that birth and wanted to go into her second with a different approach, which turned out to be a really good thing because she had an accidental home birth. All right, let's hear from Magdalena. Hi, Magdalena. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you for being here today. I am so excited. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're going to get to your stories in a minute, but before we get to that, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, so my name is Magdalena Berger. I am 35. I now have two children, Olive, who is about two and a half, and then my son, Sonny, who was born about five months ago. I live in South Jersey currently, um, right on the coast. My husband is a pilot in the U.S. Coast Guard, so we actually move about every four years. But currently, we are in New Jersey. We'll be moving next year. Both of my children were born here at this location. So I own my own swimwear line, which I started in 2016 called Magdekind Designs. And I also run my family's. We have an Airbnb, which is actually where I'm at recording because it's quiet and you can't hear the kids. (laughs) Um, So I also run my family's Airbnb throughout the summer because we live right on the coast. And then I stay home with the kids while my husband works. His job requires him to be deployed about one third of the year. So he's gone a lot. And then we also move a lot. So um, we're always busy and I'm always on the move, but we are in a beautiful era of our life, raising our two children and just 
trying to enjoy it all in the middle of the chaos. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for that. Let's go ahead and start with finding out you were pregnant with your first and how your pregnancy went. We had just moved to New Jersey in 2020 during COVID. We had moved from Puerto Rico and my husband and I were engaged when we found out that we were pregnant. It was a little bit of a surprise, but it was a good surprise. At first, I was probably more scared than he was. He was immediately excited, which is pretty cute. So we had just moved here. So we had to set up the doctors and find an OB that we liked and all this kind of stuff. So this being my first pregnancy, I hadn't really thought much about what kind of birth I wanted. Um, I didn't really have a, a strong opinion either way. I honestly didn't even really know what a midwife was. When I found an OB that I liked in the area, this office happened to have midwives working there as well, but I didn't really know what they were. So throughout the pregnancy, I did see both an OB and a midwife and just rotated through all of the people, all the staff that worked at the office. Again, like I didn't really have any big preference on the birth. I just wanted everything to be smooth and healthy and the pregnancy was just that. I didn't have any issues during the pregnancy. We did end up finding out the gender. We did the early genetic testing around 11 weeks. You know, I think just being our first, we were just so excited and wanted to make sure everything was good. So we did the 11 week genetic testing and found out we were having a little girl. We had wanted to do some type of like Lamaze courses or birthing classes, but during the time, because it was COVID, the hospital had canceled all of these types of programs. So people had kind of recommended books to me and I read a few. A lot of the books I read were very impartial to any specific birth plan. It was like, you know, here's the pros and cons of a physiological birth and here's the pros and cons of an epidural and here's, you know, why you might need a C-section. I did try my best to take in as much information as possible, but I wasn't really opinionated on how I wanted the birth to happen. I was just more, again, like whatever happens, happens. So around the second trimester, I thought, well, you know, because the hospital isn't offering these, any types of classes, maybe we should consider hiring a doula. So my husband and I talked about it for a while and he agreed. He thought maybe this would help take some of the pressure off him as well during the birth. You know, if we have somebody else there that can kind of help me through the breathing and the labor and be like a second opinion in the hospital room, we were planning on having a hospital birth. So we did a little research. We found a doula in the area and someone had recommended her. Um, but again, it was still COVID. So I had wanted to meet up with her more, I think, than what we were able to do. I am more of like a hands-on type of learner. So I guess I really was hoping to get more hands-on techniques, like how to breathe, what positions to be in, have somebody show me. And it never really happened, which is okay. So the doula, we, we did a lot of video chatting and she was more just kind of like, I'm going to be there for the birth. Let's not stress about it too much. She told us, you know, the basics, like when your contractions are 411, we're going to head into the hospital. Just keep me posted and I'll join you at the hospital kind of thing. So, yeah, so that was kind of just our plan. Like we had the doula in place. We hadn't really practiced too much, but we were just hoping that she would be there. She'd be able to help us through it. Everything would go smoothly. But the day that I went into labor, she actually had another client. So I went in on my due date to do the non-stress test. And I went to the hospital and my daughter failed the non-stress test. Like they couldn't find her heart rate. So they had wanted to do an induction. I declined. They had offered the membrane sweep and I said, okay, you know, let's try that. I I really don't want to be induced. I was trying to get a hold of my doula at that point. And this is when she had told us, oh, I actually have another client right now that is also in the same situation and she's going to be induced. So I'm not going to be able to be there with you right now, but get the membrane sweep, go home and rest, and then keep me posted. Let's see what happens. So um, we do just that. We get the membrane sweep, and then I go home that night, and about 3 a.m., my contractions start. And this is my first time, so it takes me about an hour to realize that it's a contraction, but eventually I get out of bed around 5 a.m., 
and sitting in the bathtub, just trying to relax. My husband comes in and we time the contractions and they're at the 411 mark at that point. They were four minutes apart for one hour and then one minute in between. I think it's what it is. So at that point we called the doula and she still happens to be with the other client, but we're not panicking. She's like, just keep me posted when you feel, if you feel like you're ready to go to the hospital, then go ahead and go in. She was kind of saying, you don't sound ready. Like the fact that you're able to still talk, but if the contractions are 411 and you feel like you need to go, you know, go ahead. But this is also my first pregnancy. So of course we're a little bit excited. So we decide, yeah, let's just, let's go ahead and go in. They are 411. Let's go and see what happens. So we get to the hospital and we're in triage and we're in triage for a while. I was not very far dilated, about three centimeters, maybe two or three. I can't remember exactly now, but they have us stay in triage for a while. I'm vomiting. I have diarrhea, but I'm not still not really progressing. Eventually, they allow us to check into a room, but I'm still not dilating. So they are also worried that the baby's not giving them a good reading on the monitor. So they're kind of being starting to put a little bit of pressure on um, the OB and the nurse. And I don't really remember the OBs or the midwife. I just only remember the nurse. But I remember her telling me that the OB wants to insert the balloon to help me dilate faster. And I had never even heard of the balloon. At this point, I was thinking like, okay, maybe I didn't really do enough research. I don't know what that is. But they're telling me, we're going to have to insert the balloon. You're not dilating fast enough. And at one point, I remember the nurse telling me, if you think you're in pain now, just wait until the balloon is inserted. And at this point, I kind of started to panic. So the contraction started at 3 a.m. So it was about 11 or 12 hours in at this point when I decided that, okay, if they're going to insert the balloon and I'm already in this much pain, maybe I should consider doing some type of medication. So I went with the epidural and it was placed. And the last time I was checked, I was still only like four centimeters. But after the anesthesiologist placed it, I immediately dilated to nine centimeters. So as soon as he placed it, the midwife came in, she checked me and was like, wow, that was really fast. You went to nine centimeters. So at this point, my husband is calling the doula again and he's telling her, okay, she's at nine centimeters. They're going to have her start pushing soon within the next hour she's going to start pushing. At this point, my doula says, I'm I'm sorry, I'm still with this other client, but I'm going to send in a backup doula. So the epidural was honestly great. So as soon as they placed it, I was able to take a short nap and I could still feel the pressure. So when they woke me up about 45 minutes later and they wanted me to start pushing, they just said, you know, you're going to feel the pressure. When you feel it, we're going to push. Uh, I was on my back and I pushed for about 15 minutes. I think they said exactly it was 16 minutes and my daughter was born. It was seemingly very smooth and very, very easy. After she was born, I just, I got up and I walked to the bathroom, which I think was contrary to a lot of things that I had heard about an epidural that, you know, you're not going to be able to walk for a while. You might have to get a catheter. Um, But it was, for me, it was a very smooth process. And I remember even thinking like, wow, wow. I really should have just came to the hospital and got the epidural placed right away because it's how smoothly I thought that it all went. So it was beautiful. I mean, it was really everything that I thought it was going to be, holding my daughter for the first time. The placenta was delivered, which I don't really remember much of. I didn't really feel that at all. But the placenta was delivered. I remember seeing it. They did the delayed cord clamping and my daughter latched right away. We went up to the maternity suite and it was beautiful. Honestly, it was it was wonderful. So we were ecstatic. At one point, so throughout the night, the adrenaline started to wear off and the reality of giving birth sinks in. And there was no complication or anything specific that was traumatic. But I think just the intensity of it feels at the time a little bit traumatic. So as the adrenaline started to wear off, I'm like, you know, we're up in the maternity suite with our brand new daughter for the first time. And I'm like, whoa, what just happened. And so my husband and I started kind of trying to process, you know, everything that happened. And of course I'm like, wait, where was the doula? Cause she did end up sending in a backup doula. But at that point when the backup doula arrived, I already had my feet up and was pushing, which was a really quick process too. Like I said, it was like 15 minutes. So I remember kind of being like, wait, but like what happened to our original doula? And we were like, yeah, you know, I could tell my husband was kind of like upset that she wasn't there with us. And I just like looked at him and I said, look, 
I'm not going to let it ruin this experience. I'm not going to let it bother me. Like what's not hold any negativity about that. This is our moment. This is our daughter's birth. And I just want to drop it. I don't, I don't want to worry about, I don't want to focus on the fact that she wasn't able to be there with us. And so that's kind of like where we left it. And then everything was fine. My postpartum was great. I had good support. I had hired a therapist before the birth, about halfway through the pregnancy. So with my husband in the military, we are fortunate. We have great health insurance, which covers psychologists. So I had been doing talk therapy for a while, um, anticipating some postpartum depression, just because I have some history of anxiety, you know, and some types of hormonal imbalances in my past that have caused anxiety. So I thought this would be helpful. So I, I had the therapist in place, which was really helpful. I had a good support system. My mom was here and was able to stay with us for a while. My husband had decent paternity leave. So the postpartum, everything was great. And we just were like, this was a great birth process. Everything was beautiful. Everything was fine. Everything was kind of how we intended it to be. And we were happy with that. Yeah, yeah. That's such an interesting perspective too. I'm so interested to hear how that impacts your next birth. And like, I feel like when people are like, everything was fine, but maybe are still thinking about how things could be different um, and how they go about planning their next birth. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened was yeah. we didn't really think about it until I was pregnant again for the second time. So I was still working with the same therapist and I still am to this day. So I was working with her and around you know the end of the first trimester, I start to think about birth again. And I'm telling her that I'm scared. You know, I'm, I have a lot of anxiety around the birth and I'm starting to feel this like some type of trauma that it doesn't seem like it should have been traumatizing, but I feel really intensely about it. And what I realized was it wasn't that anything specifically had happened during the birth, but just the intensity of it all. And not knowing what birth is going to be like for the first time and not having I don't want to say I didn't have the support, but I think I hadn't prepared myself enough. And me and my husband both just kind of relied too much on having the doula there. We thought, oh, you know, we'll hire the doula and then we won't have to put in any of the work for ourselves. And that's very, I think looking back, that was very naive of me thinking, oh, like if I just have somebody there to help coach me through breathing, I won't need to practice the breathing. So I think that there was a lot of trauma around the intensity of the whole situation with the lack of support or knowledge on my behalf. So I wasn't prepared enough. So I'm working with my therapist and I'm telling her this and I'm just really scared of the birth. I just feel like it was a lot for me. And I, again, like I didn't know what the balloon was when the nurse had mentioned it. And so I just was like, I'm just scared. I'm scared that these other things are going to come up and I don't know enough. And my husband and I were kind of like, well, we don't really want to hire another doula after that experience. And we didn't really know what to do. So one thing that my therapist was great about was just helping me work through this. And one thing she recommended was like, you know, one, why don't you do the work? Like, why don't you get the resources? Why don't you learn about birthing as much as you possibly can. And then two, whether you send it to the doula or not, why don't you write a letter kind of just to put it out into the universe? Like I felt let down during this birth and this is why. And just to kind of help myself process what happened and how I felt unsupported and just to kind of get it out of my head. I did both of those things and I never ended up sending the letter to the doula and I don't blame the doula. I understand things happen. So it was just, it was just more of me to just get that negativity out, but I did get all the resources. So that's when I started listening to the birth hour podcast, like religiously. And I ordered some books online and I started asking friends what they recommend. So I got the birthing from within book by Pam England and Rob Horowitz and I'm a very hands-on learner. So I enjoyed this book a lot. There was a lot of projects and like working with your hands and making things to trying to help process past births and prepare for future births. Someone had also recommended to me Ina May's Guide to Childbirth, which ended up being extremely helpful. I read it front to back four or five times. I don't even know. I read the whole thing through twice. And then towards the end of the pregnancy, I was just reading the birth stories over and over at night. I, I couldn't really focus on reading anything else. I just was so obsessed with birth. And then I also got the, I think it's called the Expectful app. I don't have, I deleted it off my phone now, but I did download the app, which had a lot of good hypnobirthing soundtracks and meditations. Honestly, I waited till the end to download 
that. I just, I did a lot, a lot of work on my own. And then towards the end, when I was just kind of rereading stuff, I decided someone had mentioned that app. And so I started doing the meditations as well at the end. So those are my main resources, the podcast, the birthing from within, Ina May's guide to childbirth, and then the app. So my husband and I did discuss hiring another doula. It wasn't like we immediately ruled it out. I do understand the importance of doulas. And I think that they are extremely helpful for people. We just had this specific experience where we were like, I knew I didn't want to repeat the same experience. And that was one of the issues with the experience. So I guess I said that we didn't get a doula, but we did discuss it and our insurance doesn't cover it. So that was one of the reasons why we thought, let's just let it go. And I'm just going to do the research on my own. And I'm going to put full confidence in myself that I can do this. I know that I can advocate for myself and I'm capable of giving birth and I'm going to empower myself to be able to do this. And that was kind of my mindset. So Mm -hmm. we decided we weren't going to find out the gender around the 21 week, they do the 21 week scan. I had told the technician that we didn't want to know the gender. She did the whole scan perfectly fine was saying baby was not using any pronouns. And then in the last minute, she said, Oh, I didn't get a good profile. Let me see if she'll cooperate for one more picture. And so at that point she said, she'll like, if she will cooperate. And I was like, Oh man, I didn't mention it. And then the technician kind of played it off. She said, oh, the baby, let's see if the baby will cooperate kind of thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So we didn't want to know the gender, but then the technician had slipped up. We also were a little bit like, well, maybe she did it on purpose or maybe it was just a slip and she really didn't mean it kind of thing. So we tried to let it go. But me and my, my husband, my mom, we were all like, yeah, it's probably going to be a girl, which is still exciting. We just wanted to be surprised. So this time around at the doctor's office, I stuck with the same OB office, but you know, because I was reading the resources and Ina May's guide, I, I did know what a midwife was this time. And I actually decided that I was going to try to book my appointments with the midwives more than with the OB. So over the course of the nine months, I developed a stronger connection with one particular midwife. And she was one of the newer staff that had helped in the past year or so implement a lot of natural birthing techniques into the hospital. So she was one of the midwives who advocated for getting the peanut balls and for larger bathtubs in every single room for getting the squat bars for pushing. So I developed a pretty strong connection with her. I felt that she understood where I was coming from. And I also just, I started out the pregnancy thinking, you know, the epidural last time wasn't horrible. I'm not going to rule that out. Let's just, you know, see how it goes. But around the second trimester, and as I started reading the books and kind of doing the work with the birthing from within and Ina May's guide and listening to the birth hour podcast, I at some point did decide that I really wanted to have a physiological birth and that was going to be my goal. And because my husband and I weren't sure if we wanted to have any more kids, that this was my last pregnancy and my last birth, that that was going to be what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to have a physiological birth. So I was really happy with the midwife and and I did did develop this strong connection with her and I I felt very supported in that sense. And also it was my second time around. So I knew what to expect. I mean, to an extent, I knew what to expect and I felt more confident. So I trusted myself more. So my due date arrives and I am still pregnant, but I woke up that morning on my due date and had really bad diarrhea. So with my first birth, when I was in labor, I was didn't have any nausea or anything leading up. But when I was in labor, I had a lot of vomiting and a lot of diarrhea. And that was something that I wasn't prepared for either. I actually didn't know that was even a thing. So the day of my due date with my second birth, I woke up that morning and I had some nausea, but I had an appointment at the doctor's office. I go in and I tell her, this was the first time that I was willing. I didn't want to do any exams prior to my due date. I told myself, if we go over the due date and I'll allow them to check. But otherwise I just, I want to just let things kind of happen on their own. So on my due date, I'm nauseous and I go into the doctors for my appointment and I have her check me and I'm one and a half centimeters dilated and 50% effaced, which is like really nothing. It doesn't really mean anything. And this point, I think I had seen an OB that day. It wasn't a midwife, but so the OB says, you know, is your due date and Around this time, we like to start scheduling an induction just so we have something on the calendar just in case. And I just was like, yeah, okay, you know, maybe 
let's see what happens in the next few days. I tell her, you know, I, I did have some diarrhea this morning and I have been feeling a little nauseous. So I'm thinking maybe this is early signs of labor. I don't want to push anything yet. Let's just see what happens. And she offers the membrane sweep. And I denied that as well. I thought I really just want things to happen on their own. I also this time didn't schedule the non-stress test because the last time with my first birth, when I went in for the non-stress test on my due date and then my daughter failed the non-stress test, that's kind of where I felt like the pressure started right there. And then they wanted to do the induction. They made me sign the waiver to leave the hospital without the induction. They wanted to do the membrane sweep. It was just kind of, I felt like the pressure was on at that point. So this time I had decided to wait and schedule the non-stress test until a few days after my due date, just so it would give me a little bit more time to go into labor on my own. So on my due date, so I'm at the appointment. I say no to the induction. And I say no to the membrane sweep. And they sent me home and I just, I'm so happy. I'm feeling great. I mean, I have a little bit of nausea, but I'm just kind of lounging around and I try to just eat small meals thinking this could be early labor. As the day continued, my nausea and vomiting increased. And at some point I'm like convinced that now I just have the flu and I'm like, it can't be early labor. This is so bad. Like I, I, I feel so sick and I'm vomiting. And then my daughter, who's at the time wasn't quite two yet, but she also has some diarrhea in her diaper. So I'm like, okay, great. Like we're all coming down with the flu and I'm starting to just panic. At one point that evening, I have like a major meltdown and my mom and my husband are trying to convince me that it's not the flu. You know, it's probably just early labor. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just, I feel like if it is the flu, I'm never going to get this physiological birth that I want because I'm going to be so dehydrated and so exhausted. And I'm just being like a complete catastrophist. Like everything isn't going to work out because I don't feel good. But they were great. They were really supportive. And they're like, they're trying to be nice about it. They're like, we don't think you have the flu. We think you're just probably in early labor. Like, just chill out. So the next day, I wake up and I'm starting to feel a little better. The nausea has let up a little bit. I'm able to eat some food. And we had in the fridge some Pedialyte popsicles, which ended up being really helpful throughout the labor as well. So I have some Pedialyte popsicles and I have some toast and I'm able to get some soup down. And I really just am starting to feel better. I'm like, okay, you know, maybe it's not the flu. And then even my mom's like, you know what, honey, even if it is the flu, you're not going to be the first woman to give birth with the flu. Like you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to do this. You're going to get through it. So I'm really grateful that I had that voice of reason and they were able to just calm me down and I felt supported. So I'm starting to feel better that next day. So that's one day after my due date. So that night we go to bed and around 11 p.m. I hear my daughter crying in the baby monitor. And so I go in her room and I'm just helping her fall back asleep and I'm rubbing her back and I start to feel some cramping. So I thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, it, it could be contractions, but the last trimester of the second pregnancy was I had a lot of the Braxton Hicks and a lot of lightning crotch and just, it was hard to say if it was, it didn't feel like labor contractions. I don't think yet. It was just kind of like, I have some light cramping. Let's just see. So that's at 11 PM and I end up going back to bed and then I wake up around three 30 and again, the cramping and I feel a contraction and I'm like, okay, that's definitely a contraction. So I sat up and I'm feeling it out and I'm like looking at the clock and about 20 minutes later, there's another one. So I'm like, okay, these are definitely contractions, but I need to go back to sleep. I had a really hard time getting comfortable. So I got up and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take a hot shower, try to get comfortable, just let it go, you know, try to get back to bed. And I know that these are contractions, but they weren't strong enough to really, they don't deserve any attention yet. And I really need to get some more sleep. So take the hot shower and I head back to bed. I'm able to fall back asleep. I'm off and on just sleeping and resting until about 5.30 in the morning. That's when my husband gets up and you know we're awake and I'm telling him, oh, I'm starting to have some contractions, but they're still really light. I feel really good. And I tell him, I actually have some appetite. So I think we should try to get some food, You know, try to eat something light this morning while I still have an appetite. Because, you know, if these keep getting stronger, I don't want to be in the situation where I'm in labor and I'm hungry. And so he's like, yeah. So he makes me some chia seed pudding and he does the fruit and the honey and it's delicious. And I'm like, okay, like I think we're in labor and I'm eating and I don't feel like I have the flu anymore and this feels good. Like, you know, 
So my daughter gets up around seven and it's really was just a very relaxed, beautifully calm morning. We put on the TV for her and I just let her watch for the first time ever. She watched Dora the Explorer, which it was fun to have something new for her that she has never seen that show before. So it was like, you kind of kept her distracted and she was into it and she just watched TV and we just kind of lounged around and I was continuing to have contractions, but they were, you know, 20 minutes apart and pretty mild. So I had the yoga ball out and my daughter and I were sharing uh, the Pedialyte popsicles and I was just kind of eating small little snacks when I could. I had a bowl of soup and it was very calm and seemingly normal and I knew I was in labor, but it was okay. And it seemed like from the day before where everything was a catastrophe and I had the flu and I didn't know if it was labor or I was sick to the next day it was labor and everything was fine and we were just going with it. And my mom had been with us for about a week because she was planning on staying with, you know, my daughter when we were at the hospital. So, and so we were watching the series alone. So we had one final episode to see who was going to win. So that day around 1230, we all sat down to watch the final episode and I'm still having contractions. So about every 15, 20 minutes, they pause the TV and I would just, you know, sit on my yoga ball and I was like doing my breaths and breathing in and then saying my mantras and breathing out. And then we'd press play again. We ended up finishing the episode. And at this point, I actually, I was taking notes in my phone as the day progressed, just so I would kind of be able to, you know, remember the story. And at this point, I even wrote, you know, contractions are 15 to 20 minutes apart, but I'm just riding each wave and enjoying myself. So I think I really was just in a really good mind frame at that time. It just, everything was fine. So we finished the episode of the show and it was time for my daughter's nap. So at that point I was like, you know, contractions haven't really picked up, but I feel like maybe once my daughter goes down to sleep and I'm able to get some space, like maybe I can kind of get things going a little more. So my daughter goes to sleep around one and I told my husband, I'm going to get in the bath and I'm just going to try to relax and keep breathing through these contractions and see if we can kind of get things moving Because at that point, they were still about the same as they had been, you know, at 3.30 in the morning. So I get in the hot bath and I tell my husband, come in the bathroom, sit with me. He gets this contraction timer out. And I was like, let's just, you know, see how things are going. So we put on the hypnobirthing soundtrack. Uh, I think this one we just had found on Spotify. And he's sitting there with me and we're having conversation. And I mean, everything was just it felt great. Like I wasn't in pain. I was just, you know, breathing through the contractions. I was thinking every contraction of these things I had practiced was okay. Every contraction, you never have to do this one again. So as it was coming and I, you know, you start to get a little like, Oh my God, it's going to hurt. You just think after this one, never have to do it again. And I was doing the breathing techniques where you breathe in through your fingers and then out through your head and back down through your feet. And as the breath goes down, I'm envisioning myself opening up and I'm saying all the mantras in my head. I'm saying good and open. And I'm just doing this in the bath for about an hour. So at one point, my husband, you know, he has a contraction timer out and he's like, okay, you know, the contractions are about seven minutes apart. So I'm like, all right, cool. You know, we, we were able to speed things up. So I'm like, you know, we're in there an hour and a half. So around 2.30, I say, all right, well, let's get out of the tub and then let's just see if we can keep things moving. At this point too, I hear my daughter get up from her nap. And so my mom's back in there and she's helping my daughter change her diaper and get everything ready. I'm like, all right, let's get out of the tub. So we get out of the bathtub and I go into my bedroom and I'm going to try to get dressed. And I sit down on the bed and I'm naked because I just got out of the tub and I stand up. I'm having, you know, I'm still having these contractions. So I sit down, I stand up and I notice that there's blood on the bed. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe I think I lost my mucus plug. So I go into the bathroom and then I have another contraction and there's more blood. And sure enough, I can actually see the mucus plug. So I tell my husband, babe, can you come in? Can you change the sheets out? I'm okay. There's just blood on the sheets. I think I lost my mucus plug. And yeah, everything's still fine. I'm trying to get dressed at this point, but I do realize the contractions are starting to pick up. So I I think I just only maybe have on underwear and my husband, you know, takes the sheets off the bed and he's changing them. And I'm like, well, let's try to do some of those, the counter pressure on the hip. I'm like, let's try those. We had kind of practiced some, we had watched some YouTube videos. I'm like, let's try those because it feels like we got out of the tub and things are starting to pick up and I'm going to try something different. So 
we do like two contractions like that and I'm leaning on the bed and he puts the counter pressure and the first one I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. All right. You know, whew, yeah, that felt okay. And we do another one and I'm just like, no, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm like, stop touching me. I'm like, it's not working. And this is kind of when I, I think I start to go from this, like everything is great and I'm enjoying myself to like, oh my God. Okay. All right starting to get a little bit more just irritated with everybody else around me. And I'm starting to get in the zone at this point. So I'm like, the counter pressure is not working. So I'm like, I got to go to the bathroom. So I go back in the bathroom and I sit on the toilet and I just have this huge contraction and I feel the sweat just beating all over my face, my forehead. And it's like, it's this like wave of nausea again. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is so intense and I'm thinking for a moment, I'm like, is this transition? And then all of a sudden, I'm also thinking, no, it's not transition. Your contractions were seven minutes apart still. It was way too early for a transition. Like, all right, you know, you got this. So I get off the toilet. I go back in the bedroom and I tell him, I'm like, I think we should time the contractions again. So he's like, okay. And we get through three contractions and they're three minutes apart. And he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, I just, at that point, I just couldn't, I couldn't think. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, why are you asking me? What do I think? He's like, well, he's like, they're three minutes apart. He's like, I remember him saying, I just want to get to the hospital. And then we're in the same situation that we were the first time where you're not dilated enough. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. He's right. And he's like, what do you think? He keeps asking me like, do you want to go? And I'm like, oh my God. I like look at him. I'm like, please stop asking me. I was like, you need to just make a call. And you can tell he's like kind of getting annoyed too. He's like, I don't know. But we had prepared for this moment. At some point, I had told him, hey, when I can no longer speak, you need to say it's time to go to the hospital. Not that I blame him because we both were like, he was saying, oh, yeah, you know, I just don't want you to go. And then it's the same thing as the first time where we ended up sitting in triage. And I'm thinking, he's right. He's right. I think it's too early to actually be transitioned. But I just, I don't really want to think. So I'm just like, I don't know. But anyway, so he's like, yeah, I think we should go. I'm like, yeah, I think we should go. So I said, start packing. And I said, I'm going to go out the back door because my daughter's in the living room and these contractions are so intense. I don't even want her to see me having a contraction on the way out the door. And I'm like, let me try to get dressed. And then you start packing the car. So he starts packing the car and he comes back in and I'm, I am trying to get clothes on, but he sees me and like, come on, babe, like you need help getting the clothes on. And I was like, yeah, but let me go to the bathroom one more time. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I don't know. I feel like I have to poop or something. And he's like, okay. And so I go back in the bathroom and I sit on the toilet and I feel this massive, massive contraction. And all up until this point, I was doing my mantras good and open. And I was able to keep the sounds low, like what is recommended with this kind of sound, but I am having all of a sudden this massive contraction and this low sound starts getting higher and higher and higher. It's like, Ooh, I hear it going up and it doesn't stop. It feels like, I don't even know two minutes, but at some point I'm like, Oh, okay. I know what's happening. So I put my hand down and I feel the sack bulging. So I'm like, Oh my God, I'm giving birth. Like my body was just <laughs> pushing the baby. Wow. Yeah. So at that point, you know, as much as I had prepared and read and felt like, I mean, I could be like a certified doula at this point. I put in so much work, but I thought was so much work. I realized at that moment, I was like, but I don't know how to give birth with the babies in the sack. Like I hadn't even really, I knew nothing. I really knew nothing. So <laughs> I'm like, that was my first thought was like, you know, I'm thinking if the sack had broken, I'm like, eh, that's okay. Right. Cause all the stories I've heard, like, it's okay if the baby's born without the sack, but if it's in the sack, like, do I pop? it like what do I do so that was like my first thought was like oh my god it's the sack so so my husband's like walking around I know he's like outside the bathroom door because he's trying to load up the car and I know my mom and my toddler are also out there right but I'm having this contraction and like I can't just like catch my breath enough to say I'm giving birth so eventually I do I'm like you just force yourself you've got to tell him to call 911 so I like I'm able to like catch my breath and I'm like call 911 and I hear my husband, he's like, what, why? And I'm like, oh my God, I have to freaking talk again. And I was like, the baby's coming now. And then he's like, oh my God, you know, he doesn't like scream, but he's like, oh my God, okay. So he's he picks up the phone, he got his cell phone and he's calling 911. And as soon as I said it out loud, the baby's coming now, it kind of also reality hit for me. So at that moment, I realized my moaning had gotten so high and I realized like, okay, the baby's coming now. So what do I know? And I was like, you got to take your moaning back lower. So I start going back down. Ooh. 
And I'm like telling myself, this is okay. This is okay. So I hear my husband and he's on the phone, 911 dispatchers. He's telling them, oh, my wife is giving birth. And I hear the dispatcher say like, how far apart of the contraction? He's like, no, like she's giving birth now. And then I hear the dispatcher and he's saying, okay, tell her not to push. And I'm sitting on the toilet still. And I'm like, I just saying out loud, I said, I can't, I can't, I can't. As in like, I can't stop pushing. And then I hear the dispatcher say, all right, is she laying on the ground? And in that moment, I'm like, I'm not on the ground. I'm like, I got to get off the toilet. So our bathtub is right in front of the toilet. So I just drop to my knees and then put my hands on the side of the tub. And I start kind of getting this panic. And I'm like, you know, it's just so intense that you're just, there's really, I think, you know, naturally you can't help but just panic a little bit. It's so intense and I, my body's still pushing and I'm starting to panic. And there's this story in the Ina May book, in one of the birth stories where the woman is giving birth and she says to Ina May, she's like starting to panic and she says, I'm scared, I'm scared. And Ina May grabs her head and her hands and pulls her in close and says, of what? And In that moment, I am getting emotional. In that moment, I was starting to panic. And I just imagine Ina May grabbing my head in her hands. And I've never even seen what Ina May looks like before. Like I've never even like looked her up on the internet. I just had only read her book. And I'm just envisioning her and she's holding my head in her hands. And she's like, what are you scared of? And so in that moment, I yell out to my husband and I'm on my knees and I'm holding the bathtub. And I just yell out, I'm not scared, but somebody has to catch this baby. And at the time I didn't know, right? We, we thought it was a girl, but his head was born. And there was like a slight pause in the contraction. I mean, I want to say like three seconds, if even. And then my body just pushed the rest out. And at that point, the police officer had just walked in the bathroom and caught his shoulders. And at the same time, as his shoulders came out, I feel the bag just pop. And I'm like hanging on the bathtub, just laughing and smiling. And I'm like, just the relief that you feel in that moment is just amazing. And I'm like, just saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I hear the police officers behind me and uh, I don't hear the baby crying right away. So I'm, but I'm still just in so much, not really shocked, but just in this intense moment that I'm like, I, you can't even process really anything else besides the relief. And I didn't know they're police officers. I just hear two men behind me and I hear the one and he says to the other one, like, can you get suction, suction the face, suction the nose. And then, you know, I, I'm not really sure how long it was to me. It felt like a minute. It was probably again, just three seconds. And then the baby, he started crying. But I remember just like, I, I couldn't really even turn around yet to see. Cause I just, I was like laughing and smiling with relief, but also just part of me is like, I don't hear a baby crying. So I just was like stuck in one position as soon as I heard the baby crying, I said, uh, is he okay? Is the baby okay? Is the baby okay? And they said, yes, yes, yes. I said, well, what is it? What is it? And they didn't answer. I'm like, is it a boy or a girl? And then I heard him say, congratulations, you have a baby boy. And at that point I turned around and I saw my son, he's laying on the bathroom floor. And, uh, it was just amazing. I, I like couldn't believe it. He's just crying. And I'm like, oh my God, I just pick him up. I'm like, we did it. We did it. And I look at my husband and he's, my husband is sitting in the bathroom door frame with his, he's like crouched down with his face in his hand. And he's just like rubbing his face. He's like, oh my God. And you're like mouthing. Oh my God. Like can't even speak. And I'm like, honey, it's a boy. It's a boy. Cause we were just convinced it was going to be a girl. My husband's like laughing. He's like, okay, babe, like I get it. It's a boy, but like, <laughs> oh my God, like you really just did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, later, you know, we, we realized that the police officers got there first because I guess they said that they were just right around the corner at the time they were on another call with like a dog, angry dog or something. And then My husband called and then within four minutes, the baby was born. So they were right around the corner. Oh man, that's amazing. Yeah. And then they walked right into the house. Otherwise I would have just pushed him out on the bathroom floor, which I guess would have been fine. I mean, I I think it happens a lot. You know, it wasn't like a huge drop, but luckily his head was out when they walked in the bathroom door and they just put their arms out. It was a young officer and it's funny too. I mean, there's a lot of little funny things that happen. I guess when the officer walked in, he said to my husband, like, I need a towel and a bowl of water. 
So my husband's like trying to find a bucket of water, but he ends up getting like a glass baking dish and like filling it with water. <laughs> and then like even the other, when the EMTs came, they're like, what were you going to do with the water? Like, were you going to baptize the baby? And the officer was like, <laughs> yeah, I don't really know. Like, he's like, I've never done that before. I just saw it in a movie, but you have to have some water. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of like little funny things like that. Yeah. He needed boiling water to sanitize instruments right. that he didn't have. Right. Or like maybe... <laughs> Maybe like, like a hot compress or something, but we're like, well, that wasn't going to uh-huh. happen either. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I bet he had quite the story to tell at the end of that shift. <laughs> oh, I know. He was so happy, the police officer. Aww. Yeah, it was really, it was adorable. But it was actually funny because when I was pregnant and I was seeing the midwife, she had asked me at one point, like, how do you feel about having male residents or doctors or nurses in the room during your birth? And I thought about it for a while and I was like, you know what? I think for this birth, I really just want to keep it like as minimum amount of people as possible. And I'd like it all to be female. It's like, that's kind of just like the environment I want to create. She was like, okay. So we had marked that on the birth plan was like, no one unnecessary and, you know, try to keep it all females. And then when you end up calling 911, you get, we had like two fire trucks, two EMTs, police officers. I mean, we had the whole first responders team in our town at our house. Right. (laughs) And it was all males. So (laughs) it was a lot of males, but it was okay. I was just in my own world. Like I was blissed out, just so happy that it was over and that it was fast and that I didn't have to ride in a car and all the things that I realized afterwards that a lot of the things that I was nervous about were actually things that involved the hospital. So it was just a relief. I was just in a whole different world. I didn't really care. But one of the things that I think is important that I mentioned in case anyone is ever also in this situation was delivering the placenta. So I was on the bathroom floor still and I didn't want to cut the cord, but I had told at this point an EMT was there. I'd asked him, I said, well, we should push the placenta out because at this point I had been on the floor for like, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And I'm like, I think I asked him, like, do you think I should push the placenta out? Like, should we deliver the placenta? I didn't feel any urge to push anymore. So He said, "Um, no, he's like, no, no, honey, it's okay. You know, a lot of women, you can leave it in for a while. And I knew that you could, because I knew about the like cord clamping and and these kind of things, but I hadn't really thought too much about how long you could leave it in. So I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just get to the hospital. So they're like cleaning us up and they're also EMTs. So one of their protocol was to take the baby's blood sugar level And I don't know anything about this. So I'm like, okay, so they're taking his blood sugar level and they're saying that he's low. So they're like, well, maybe we let's try to get him to latch. And then if not, we're going to have to give him like sugar water. So I'm like, okay. So I breastfed my first daughter for a year. So I'm like comfortable with it. I, I kind of knew what we were doing. So I like, you know, I latch him on and he's latching fine and he's like eating right away. And they're like, okay, good, you good. Okay. So they take the test again before we leave the house. So we're sitting on the couch and they're like cleaning everything up. And so they take the test again and his blood sugar was still low. And so he's like, I'm kind of worried. Let me just call my boss. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I really don't want to give the baby anything until we get to the hospital and are able to see the pediatricians. Like, can you ask your boss if that's okay? So he calls his boss and he's telling the boss like, okay, the baby's blood sugar is low. She wants to just wait till we get to the hospital. Is that okay? And the boss is like, yeah, yeah, that seems fine. You know, let her make that call. But again, I still have the placenta in. So they put me in the in a wheelchair and they push me out to the ambulance. The baby's like in my lap and I, I still have the cord. So I don't even, I was wearing like sweatpants, but there's a photo that I had shared with you of we're outside and my daughter and my mom at this point are outside because when my husband called 911 and the EMTs and everyone had arrived, my mom took my daughter outside and they're like playing with like sidewalk chalk. My mom's like trying her best to like, you know, keep my daughter occupied, but there's a photo of us outside and the baby's wrapped up in my chest and she wants to see like the baby, the baby. So my mom like holding her up and she's like peeking inside and I'm in a wheelchair and holding the baby. It's a really beautiful moment. Honestly, it's one of my favorite pictures, but anyway, so the placenta was still in me at this time. And the EMT said, well, we're just going to ride nice and slow to the hospital. You know, we'll take it easy. You just keep the baby with you and keep him latched on. And the baby is nursing. And my husband followed behind us in our car and he brings our hospital bag and everything that we had packed. But as we're driving to the hospital, I I'm still feeling a lot of cramping, but I don't have an urge to push. And so 
still not really thinking that much of it. Um, by the time we get to the hospital, it had been about an hour and a half since I delivered. So one of the first things that the OB does is, you know, she comes in and she's like checking me and making sure like, you know, there's no tearing or anything. And she starts pulling on the cord. I like, they're, you know, she's like inserting her hand to try to get the placenta out. And I say to her, I'm like, it's really, really painful. Like, can you please stop? I'm like, please, can we just wait for it to naturally come out? I don't feel the urge to push. And she gets really serious and she looks at me. She's like, your cervix is closing. It's almost halfway closed and we need to get the placenta out right now. At that moment, I'm like, oh my God, I just did this whole birth at home and now I'm at the hospital. They're going to have to cut me open to get the placenta out. And I like start to panic in my head and I'm like, okay. I tell her, I'm like, just tell me when to push. I'm going to push. I'm going to push. And she's like, okay. So we do end up getting it out, but I was like screaming profanities. I mean, it was, and I'm not going to say it was equally as intense as birthing a baby, but at that point with my cervix being almost halfway closed, it was pretty painful. It was a really intense moment. Yeah. And scary to like, like you can tell when they get that serious voice and all of your kind of hackles go up. Yeah, it was intense. And it was scary just because I was like up on cloud nine, right? Like I just did it. I, I had right. them for the, this crazy, amazing birth. And then all of a sudden it was like, but we're going to have to go in for surgery to get this out. So mm, yeah, it was okay. It came out and I was relieved, but it's something that I think, you know, if someone was ever in that situation to just, I, I hadn't even really thought about it. The fact that as I was nursing, my son, it was cramping. My cervix was closing, like all these kind of things. I just, you're just not thinking logically, I guess, in that moment. It makes sense when I think about it now, but at the time I wasn't comprehending that that was what was happening. So something to keep in mind if anyone's ever in that circumstance that maybe just tell the EMT, like, well, it's not speed, but like, maybe let's just get there a little faster or something, you know? Yeah. Like if you're going to go somewhere to get more care, it's better to get there sooner than later for sure. Yeah, Exactly. So we got to the hospital though, and besides the placenta being, you know, this intense, painful situation, everything else was fine. The hospital has beautiful like maternity suites. And this is the same hospital I was at with my daughter. So uh, we kind of knew what was to be expected. And they weighed my son at the hospital. He was seven pounds, nine ounces. And they got us up to our room. My husband came with our hospital bag and I had all the stuff that I was preparing to use for labor. So I had the little battery powered candles and the oil diffuser, and my lavender. And we set that up in the maternity suite and just relaxed and enjoyed everything. The first night my husband stayed with me. And then the second night he decided to stay at home with my toddler just to kind of, you know, make it seem more normal. And it was good for her and for him. The beds weren't that comfortable for him either. So it was like, yeah, I was like, just go ahead, go home, see our daughter. Yeah. And it's nice, you know, like when you have a toddler, it was a, it's like a little break. I'm at the hospital. I'm like, I have my newborn. It's just it's like a moment. It's a moment, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. Enjoy the snuggles without worrying about the other human right. <laughs> in your life. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing those stories and all of the great resources that you listed throughout. We'll be sure to link to those from the show notes page. Do you want to share where people can connect with you? Yeah. So I am on Instagram, magdalena.rose underscore. And my swimwear brand, which is easier probably to remember, is just Magdakine. And that's on Instagram too. And yeah, I encourage anyone to reach out or send me a message. Yeah. I'm hoping that my story can at least help somebody if anyone's ever in the same situation or feeling the same way I was feeling going into birth, that maybe this can help somebody. So always welcome anybody to reach out to me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Yes. Thank you, Bryn. Now I'm going to chat with Megan about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor, and to get your free pump through insurance as well as other things like maternity compression garments and lactation education and support, head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualified through insurance form. All right, let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Aeroflow. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hi, Bryn. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into our chat about Aeroflow breast pumps? Of course. I have three kids. My oldest is four. She was born in 2017. And then we, um, my middle is two. And then my youngest is brand new. She, he is six weeks old. All right. So tell us about how you discovered Aeroflow breast pumps and uh, why you decided to use them to get your breast pump. Well, so I discovered Aeroflow through your podcast, of course, okay. <laughs> so, which I listened to religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't discover 
fortunately, I didn't discover your podcast until I was pregnant with my second. Okay. Um, and so I started using it with, with, um, with my second and then also with my third. Um, and with my first, <laughs> I of course didn't know about Aeroflow. And so I just got the prescription from the doctor and was sent to a medical supply store, had a wait in line, was just given this like brown box. <laughs> I didn't have any choice about which breast pump I was going to get. Um, so I didn't really know any better. So when I found out about Aeroflow, um, I was like, well, it's, it's almost seemed too good to be true. <laughs> and, uh, <No. laughs> and, uh, it was awesome. So it, it's, it was exactly what you said it was going to be. It was pretty incredible. That's really cool. I haven't talked to anybody who has done it without Aeroflow and with. So I'm excited to uh, hear how that was different for you. So um, for those that don't know, can you just kind of explain the process for getting your breast pump uh, for free through Aeroflow breast pumps? Sure. So I logged into the website. I typed in some of my information. I think I needed my um, my insurance information, um, due date, things like that, and then just press submit. And I think honestly, within maybe a day, maybe two days, I heard back via email and they had, they contacted my insurance company and everything. I didn't need to actually even give them a prescription. I think they contacted my midwife. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they, first they said it was just kind of in process. And then maybe a day or two later, um, I got to access my personal page that had choices of probably a dozen different breast pumps that I had to choose from. Some were free, some were for an upcharge. So it was really cool. And then I could take the time and kind of research which ones I wanted and which ones would best suit what I needed. So it was really incredible versus my first time, which I was just literally just handed a brown box. <laughs> like, this is what you get. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so that was really incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that they contact your care provider for you and your insurance and everything because just the last thing you want to be doing is making another call or figuring out how to fax something to somebody or whatever. So that part was really nice for me and especially that they work with um, midwives as well as, you know, a, a doctor's office or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And I'm not um, savvy with insurance. So is any anybody, yeah. <laughs> they make my, it really hard, yeah. not my jam. And so I don't even know, honestly know how they, they did it, but they did it, it yeah. again. Like, it, um, there are very few things that I try to give advice about to people who are pregnant, like pregnant ladies. <laughs> we already have too much advice that it's unsolicited advice coming in from people. Yeah. But the two things are always aeroflow and the birth hour. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> I love know. it. Because I don't think some, a lot of the people I've actually told about Aeroflow have never even heard of it. I'm like, this. you guys have to check this out. It sounds too good to be true. But really, this is what you should do. Yeah. So. Well, I love that. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, what pump did you end up going with for your second? And then did you get a new one for your third? I did. So this is kind of funny. So um, I... I was between the Spectra. I used the Medela with the, my first time around. And then, um, overwhelmingly advice I got was to get the Spectra, but I ended up with a Luna motif based on I've, your podcast. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I, I ended up with the Luna motif and I was really happy with that. And then the third time around, um, I actually did the super upcharging at the hands-free one. Um, I think I went with the Willow, Okay. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out, <laughs> but I'm only, <laughs> I'm six weeks postpartum. So there's a bit of a learning curve with it. And so, uh, I'll go back to work in, you know, a few months. So I'll hopefully figure it out by then. Awesome. That's so funny. I think I have done the exact same path as you. I started with a Medela and again, it was just handed to me in a brown box. And then uh -huh. I got, um, a Spectra with my second, I guess. And then, um, the Luna from Motif with my third when that came out. So oh, um, how funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the Luna was definitely my favorite by far. So yeah, it was incredible. I know. And it was just funny. Cause like I said, a lot, cause I think the Luna wasn't as well known maybe as the Spectra and the Medela. Right. And so, you know, maybe I think I took it to my Facebook page, like anyone have any recommendations and like overwhelming light was the Spectra. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go with the Luna motif. <laughs> 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 I was like, on all of the podcasts I listened to, I was like, I'm going to go with Britain's opinion on this one. And I, I was happy with it. So awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate your time today. All right. All right. Brent, take care. 
Thank you so much again to Magdalena for sharing her birth stories with us and to Aeroflow Breast Pump for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Magdalena's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Also stay tuned next week for a special discount code for our Know Your Options Childbirth course. We're going to be doing a Black Friday sale this year. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.